Let me introduce you and welcome you to our Good Friday service. I'm so glad that you're able to join us in this way. I want to introduce you to a service and a word called Tenenbrae. It's an old service. In fact, it's a form of Christian worship that's over a thousand years old. It means darkness. John's gospel and later his epistles are deeply rooted in the image of light and darkness. That Jesus is the light that came into our very dark world. Each candle that you'll see in the narrative as we unfold represents Jesus' teaching. The, finally, the final candle represents his life, which is sacrificed for us. The focal point of God's revelatory movement through redemptive history was always going to be Jesus and the sacrifice that he had on the cross. This service is saturated in scripture. You'll hear from the prophets and the psalmist and the gospels as they point forward and speak to the Christ who was to suffer on our behalf. I invite you in this time to quiet your heart, to put aside the cares and concerns of the world that so press in on us from every side. And with a quiet heart to hear the story afresh, to listen as voices from ages past tell us what happened this night that we remember what the Lord has done. And as you listen close, you will hear the voice of God telling the story that should shake the very sinews of our soul. Would you pray with me? Almighty God and loving Father, who allowed your Son, Jesus Christ, to be betrayed and handed over to sinners. To you, Lord God, whose pleasure it was to crush your beloved Son for our behalf, to allow him to be pierced through for our transgressions. We pray, Lord, that you will be present in our service and that our hearts would be reminded of your truth, of what happened, that it was our sins that made his suffering necessary. And so, Lord God, we commit this service to you. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance, beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. <clears throat> he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their face, he was despised. We held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the punishment that made us whole. By his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed 
and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. Will you make his life an offering for sin? He shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. He shall bear the iniquities. Therefore I will allot with him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors put their trust in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried out to you and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and not a human, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh and scorn. They curl up their lips and they shake their heads. Trust in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver. Let God rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are the one who drew me forth from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many young bulls encircle me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They opened their jaws at me like a slashing and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart within me, my breast is melting wax. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust. Packs of dogs close in around me and bands of evildoers encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones while they stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far away. O my help, hasten to my aid. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of wild bulls. You have rescued me. I will declare your name to my people. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You fear the Lord, give praise. All of Jacob's line give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. 
at the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God, for dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they are dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. The Gospel according to John. <clears throat> Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, he came forward and he asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and they fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, and he struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malachus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since the disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, are you not also one of the man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Why ask those who have heard what I said to them? They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is this how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna said, and had him bound and sent him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves and the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. 
Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against the man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves. Judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, and he summoned Jesus, and he asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own accord, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him on the face. Pilate went out again to them and said, Look, I am bringing him to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered the headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Then Jesus said to him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who claims to be king sets himself up against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench, a place that is called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He then said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There 
they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and they divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. The tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what scripture says, They divide my clothing among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop, and they held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was the day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. When the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him, but when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this testified, so that you may believe. He tes his testimony is true, and he knows that what he says is truth. These things occurred so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had come first to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in the linen cloths according to the burial customs of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the day, the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Why did Jesus have to suffer? Why was all of this necessary? When we face really difficult circumstances, really painful things, we often want to avert our gaze and not see even with things going on uh, around us right now, there's times when 
it's harder and more horrible than we want to let in. So we turn our attention away. But there comes a time in life when we are forced to stare straight into unbearable tragedy and difficulty. And when we do, the question that comes to our minds is why? Why is a hard question? It's a tricky question. Because why can push us to look for different sorts of answers at different levels of reality. At one level, we seek for why. Why was it necessary? Why did Jesus suffer? And we hear the story. We heard it again this evening. And we say, I know why. It's because Judas had expectations that were never going to be met. He wanted a political deliverer and to be an insider on a new movement. And Jesus never was what he wanted. And his greedy heart was corrupted. And he looked for and eventually found an opportunity to betray the one who loved him. But you can explain it another way. It's also because the chief priests and the political leaders enjoyed their political power and all the privileges and wealth that it provided. And they grew accustomed to this. And rather than have the status quo shaken up by this would-be Messiah, it was better for him to die. And it's because Pilate, who was willing to stick his neck out only so far, But when he heard the people say, we have no king but Caesar, his hand was forced and he would no longer go any further. These statements might be perfectly true. And from a historical and political sense, they convey a small part of the story. But in the end, they don't answer our question, why? Because God was not held captive to the whims of political rulers. The God of the universe and Christ's voice who holds the very cosmos together by the power of his word did not lose his life because of someone's betrayal. As Jesus said in his own words, I lay my life down. No one takes it from me. So as true as these things might be, they were not the reason why. So why? Why did Jesus suffer? Why was all of this necessary? All of the pain and all of it. Jesus had to die because of the collision of two cosmic forces rooted in the immutable character of a living God, his love and his justice. The cross was at the epicenter of the collision between God's love and his justice. The cross was the only thing which could contain these two forces, for they were both vast beyond description. God's love for us is beyond our ability to describe it. Even the most beautiful passages of Scripture try to convey this in words inspired by the Holy Spirit, that his love for us is vast beyond measure. Oh, the magnitude of the love of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus. And God was always loving us, created us in love, for love, by love, drawing all those who are separated from love into loving union. But God is not love only. He is also just. And God's justice demands that he looks sin full in the face for all that it is. For God cannot look at sin and see it for anything other than it is. 
Not even for love can justice lie. Not even for love can justice turn a blind eye to sin. God's justice demands a response. This is something I think our age of compromise and ambivalence does not understand. But to love something is to hate its opposite. To truly love life is to hate the wasteful destruction of it. To truly love light, you cannot be indifferent to the darkness. You can't truly love kindness and goodness and gentleness and shrug your shoulders at tyranny. To love the good is to hate the evil. To love freedom is to despise slavery in all of its forms. This is something our age finds so hard to understand because we're so deeply marked by moral compromise and by ambivalence and indifference. And yet for God, he has none of these things. His moral perfection demands that he looks at sin, the very cancer of our created world, and he has to hate it with all that he is. And yet he loves with an intensity and with a passion that we very rarely ever see. And so how do these two forces reconcile themselves? What happens when God's love, his agape love that loves us for our highest good, his hesed love that loves us no matter what, his loving kindness that would reach to the very ends of the earth and do everything possible that we might receive life? What happens when that runs headlong into injustice and sin? The cross is what happened. The cross was the only way. When Jesus in the garden is crying out to the Father for him to take the cup, there's an implicit question behind the tears and the pain. Is there any other way? Father, take this cup from me. But there was no other way. This was the only way. We might be used to in this life having lots of different options, but there comes a time when you're forced, when you're hemmed in on every side, where there is but one way, and it's hard. And this is where Christ found himself in Gethsemane. He found himself in the place where the only way forward through life was death. And that is why this story we just heard happened. For centuries, God pointed us to it. That is why we hear the horrible ring of the hammer. It's not an abstract problem. It's a very personal one. My sins made Christ's suffering necessary. And so did yours. It was our sins that drove God's love to find a horrible and yet final solution to send his son, fully God, fully man, perfectly fulfilling all of the demands of righteousness of the law so that we who had no other way and no hope, who were lost in our sin and sadness, who were wallowing in the mire and muck of our moral depravity. And it was in that very state that Christ came to us. I encourage you this Good Friday to let down your guard. I know some Christians struggle with this, they, they think that because of the knowledge of the resurrection, there should be no sadness, and yet Christ calls us to remember. I think we can accomplish a lot in sadness. 
50 psalms invite us into lament. When you're looking at a sad story, the appropriate response is sadness. Not just so that you're sad. So that we feel the weight of God's love revealed for us. For when you hear the hammer ring and you remember what he did and how he was pierced for our transgressions and we were healed by his wounds, that we see the magnitude of the love of God revealed to us in Christ Jesus. I invite you this Good Friday evening to quiet your soul and to let it in, the magnitude of what God's done for us, the horror of what Christ went through for us, so that you might experience afresh how, gra- how vast, how grand, how beyond measure the love of God is for you. Let that sacrifice resize your reality and remind you that you are deeply, dearly, and desperately loved by the living God. Let's pray. Lord God, we remember your sacrifice. We remember what you have done for us. Lord, we recognize that none of us are worthy for what you paid for our soul. Lord, would you draw us into the story afresh and quicken our hearts to long for your resurrected life, even as we wait in the valley of the shadow of death. It is in your name, Lord Jesus, our perfect Savior, that we pray. Amen. I invite you to a time of celebrating the resurrected life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The story, as you know, has not ended. And we invite you to join us in a time of celebrating Easter on Sunday morning. Come join us for worship.